Hi, this is Dr. Orion Taraban, and this is PSYCAX, Better Living Through Psychology, and I'm really happy to be able to present to you today Mr. Chaz Ellis. Chaz is somebody that I've personally been following on YouTube for, geez, probably like close to eight years now, and uh, he was one of the first folks uh, that I followed on social media when I started to really do deep dives into dating, psychology, and um, attraction and understanding women. I think his work is really amazing. He is down to earth. His work is very accessible. And I think it's based on his lived experience. It's very real. And I think it's also very balanced because correct me if I'm wrong, Chaz, you have like the guys channel, which I think as the name suggests, the audience is primarily men, but I think you also have a channel that's it's our audience is primarily composed of women and you do a lot of consultations with with women as well correct right absolutely so you've got a few different irons in the fire and i'm really happy to have you here today Chess. thanks for accepting the invitation hey thanks for having me so when we spoke a few months ago you told me that you were currently in the dominican republic you want to tell yep. folks why you happen to be there um, well, one of the things I'm working on right now is a documentary where I'm basically talking about people who are traveling to different countries, men and women, actually, who are traveling to different countries, um, you know, just trying to find love uh, in a way that's, I guess, you know, a little unconventional. But, um, you know, nothing that's designed. I know a lot of stuff's out there that's demonizing people for doing it or making it seem like it's a it's um that, that there's just nothing in America, but I just wanted to see exactly why people are doing it and what's making them do it and what they're in and who has different motivations. So that's kind of what I'm doing now is interviewing different people, checking out the culture. Um, I'm in the Dominican Republic right now. I'm going to travel to some other places also and do the same thing. Absolutely. I think the term that I know for that phenomenon is geo arbitrage with respect to dating. So like going around to different markets where you might have, let's say, a higher sexual marketplace value than you do right around your home. Um, right. My understanding is that unless we're leaving aside kind of like the mail order bride phenomenon where women are just sort of like going on these sites and and hoping for usually men in the West to kind of wife them up that traveling for the sexual marketplace value was really something that men were doing, like the passport bros and that kind of phenomenon. But you said that women are doing it too. Man, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen it actually around here too. Uh, a lot of times something gets popularized like passport bros and it becomes like a, a thing where people believe that that's the only thing that's happening. There are actually a lot of women, they're not calling themselves passport citizens or or whatever you want to call it. They not call themselves anything. They don't have a name for it yet. But there's a lot of women that are actually going to different countries too. And the Dominican Republic is one of them. I don't know if you ever watched the show like 90 Day Fiance or any of that, uh, where people are on K-1 visas, you know, uh, to come over to the, to the United States. Uh, so it kind of goes both ways. And there are definitely women that are doing it too. And what have you discovered so far from your time in the DR? Well, what I discovered here is, and, and I think it's one of those things where there are cultural differences anywhere you go, but people are generally the same, but there are cultural differences. And people who are looking for a specific thing, a lot of times, really what they're looking for, to be honest, is to get the most bang for their buck. A lot of people are saying, hey, here's what I've accomplished in my life. Here's where I am. Um, whether it's financially, socially, um, or whatever level that I've been able to improve myself. And I think that I might be able to get a little more of that, more for that, if I'm somewhere other than the United States, This, which is a market that's saturated with me. You know, mm -hmm. if you are an American person, the market in America is saturated with you. You know, just whatever you've accomplished still, there's going to be more of you there than there are in another country. So I just, well, I, <laughs> that's I hear what you're saying. I imagine that how much of that do you think is just, let's say the exoticism of dating somebody other versus like, I'm sure that's they, they have like specific values. Uh, Americans have specific values that aren't as dominant in other cultures that are actually um, highly value, valued by like a portion of that dating population. 
I think uh, in some cases that's that's going to be that's going to be true. But yeah, I think in some cases that's going to be true. Uh, what I've noticed is it really just depends on where you date. A lot of times when you're in America, you just try to date parallel uh, to where you are socioeconomically, um, to where you are in terms of your religion, to where you are just in terms of your political views. Everything is like try to be the exact same um, for the most part. And when people go to different countries, especially if they come here, I notice that people, the people that I've talked to even that have broadened their horizons. So yeah, they they are, like you said, they are getting different values. I don't know if that's just because they're in the Dominican Republic or they went to Thailand or somewhere like that. I don't know if it's just that or if it's the fact that they're dating people who are totally different than the people that they've dated in the past or different than themselves even. Well, we hear a lot. I mean, almost every dating coach is saying that you should date for shared values. Like you should find somebody sure. who believes kind of the things that you do. And that's the recipe for going the distance. And it sounds like one of the things that you're saying is that whether we're aware of it or not, one of the values that Americans tend to have is equality. And that might not be a value that is as um, valuable in other parts of the world where they have, let's say, more, they might be more comfortable with more unequal relationships. Is that part of what you're saying? I've seen that I'm quite quite a bit around here where and here's the thing like Americans like you said for sure most of the time Americans do have some sense of a need for equality in their relationships unfortunately what that usually leaves is a void somewhere because two people are trying to bring the same thing up to a situation it's like we're going to sit down and eat and you go I got peanut butter and jelly you know, you, you come with peanut butter and jelly and you say, what do you got? And I go, I got peanut butter and jelly also. Yes, we have both brought equal parts to the situation, but I didn't bring what you needed. If I had bread, we'd be in shape now. Now we can eat. But we both have peanut butter and jelly. We really don't need each other. Mm -hmm. you know, so Yeah, I made a video I about this true. that basically describes that inequality is the basis of relationship because um, we can't really do business. When I go to a cafe... The reason why we can actually do something with each other is because I want that cup of coffee more than I want my $3 and they want my $3 more than they want 12 ounces of their coffee. And that's how right. we can actually do business with each other. Right. So complementarity. Um, okay. Now, is it is it really that much better? Or is that just sort of like the fantasy that frustrated men and women have when they are out of luck? in um in america dating around well yeah i think whenever something happens you change when when you change your environment oftentimes you change your outlook you could take somebody who comes from a totally different country to the united states of america and most of the time they see it as a place of opportunities milk and honey uh the the greatest place on earth if you will then you have people who've been living there their whole lives and they feel like it's not really that, you know, because if you've been somewhere your entire life, everything's not new and fresh to you. So when people come to another country to date, the people are new. The the um, the different situations that they find themselves in are new. They don't think they know everything about people. They don't think they know everything about dating. Most of the time when you go out on a date and say you're, 30 even just you just 30 years old once you you've been alive for 30 years in the same place you dated people in the same place for probably at least 15 of those years and because of that most of the time you really think you know exactly what's going to happen on that date what that person's intentions are um, you're taking even little small things that happen on the date and deciding certain things about them um, even before you get to the date you're taking little small things and deciding, you know, oh, this would be the outcome if we ever had a relationship. That's what most people do. And that's because, you know, because the environment is old. When you come to a new environment, a lot of times you don't speak the language. So you're trying to figure things out in, in that you're open to the situation. And you're open to new things. You're open to new experiences. So it's, a, it's better because you're a better you and a that's better version of you. So it's almost like what you're saying is that when people already assume that 
they know how this is going to go. They kind of don't pay as much attention. They stop looking or they feel that when they see little signals of something, they inappropriately conceptualize how the future is going to go based on a limited set, set of information, but because those symbols make sense within that culture. And if they go to a different culture, the same behavior might not have the same meaning. And so they kind of have to surrender their assumptions and kind of get curious and pay more attention. And, and that in and of itself can make other people more attractive. Is that is that part of what you're saying? Um, for sure. Absolutely. I think that a lot of times what happens is, like you said, um, just following up on it, um, when you already think certain things are going to happen, the attraction just cuts off because one little thing might have happened that you've seen two or three different times in dealing with people. Like, for instance, you might have been trying to talk to the person and maybe they didn't they didn't look directly at you when you were trying to talk to them or maybe you didn't make eye contact immediately. But when you come somewhere else that you've never been before, you're like, is that a cultural thing or... Is this something that maybe they're, uh, um, you know, would, I don't even really know what the cues are to whether or not somebody likes me in this place because it's different from what I'm used to. And sometimes you get, you pay attention to the individual a lot more because you haven't grouped them in. So you are able to become more attractive. You're able to to stop putting up some of the barriers that you use to, to fence yourself in. And also you don't have as much input from other people. Most people, whenever they date, they also have friends they input, family members they input. But when you come to a whole other country, and those people aren't really just as available to you, then you don't get as much um, of the negative feedback. I hear that. I, I, there's been some videos going around lately that talk about women's committees, and it, that seems to be more of a phenomenon with women than men, where they kind of make group decisions about the boyfriend um, it happens quite a bit, yes. Yeah, that's interesting. And these things that you're talking about with like eye contact, in psychology, we call those proxemics. And it's all of these different dimensions of intangible human behavior that influence how we think about ourselves and other people that most people just take for granted. Like the, the distance that we comfortably stand um, away from each other varies significantly from culture to culture and can be a sign of like disrespect or inappropriate intimacy if you're not familiar with that um that cultural theme basically really interesting mm -hmm. so um that said the, is it fair to say that there must be something that is driving the dissatisfaction in americans both men and women to look elsewhere and if that's fair like what are you noticing when you've talked to hundreds if not thousands of men and women uh what are their common dissatisfactions um, yeah, like you said, I've been doing this for 10 years, so I've talked to thousands and thousands of people. And the dissatisfactions are usually similar for both people. They just, for both sexes, but they just think that it's only, <laughs> each one thinks that they're the only one dealing with the problem. Okay. But for most people, it's um just being unclear and not understanding what the other group wants from them. So, if you got a guy who's trying to date a, a young lady, most of the time he finds himself in a situation where he's most frustrated by the fact that he doesn't feel that her intentions are clear to him. What does this person actually want from me? What am I supposed to do to find, to be attractive to this person? What am I supposed to do to be the person that they would envision themselves with? And for most people, they feel like the bar is just too high or, or invisible and high. Uh, you know, I don't even know what to aim for because the bar is invisible. I don't even, what what am I supposed to be able to, to do in this situation to make you be attracted to me or treat me in a certain way? And how do I know when you're not? So most people become very disenchanted as they date years and years and years they become in women are are similar because they're like, OK, I know it may not take very much for you to want to sleep with me. But what does it take for you to actually want to be in a real committed relationship with me where you go forward with me? Um, and, and I actually have a certain security to know that we're going to be together for the for the duration of our lives. Even. And most women feel like I don't know 
where the what to, what those signs are. I'm not, I have no clue. So what people deal with in the United States and what causes them to want to go elsewhere is they want to believe that there is a world that's basically trapped in a set in a in a time capsule somewhere. There's a world that's trapped in a time capsule that I've heard of that, that you know, 1950, 1955, 1918 even. There's some world that's trapped in this time capsule where everything made sense and where people were honest and real and uh, the, I, I knew exactly what I needed to do in order to attract someone and for them to, to be into me and want to be with me. But I, and I think that's why people want to leave America because it just they feel like it's so complicated. There's got to be somewhere else where it's simple. And do you think that's true? No. No. I think I it's complicated because I I know in some of your videos that I've seen you speak on the idea of like the 1950s is kind of a myth that it's been romanticized. So maybe it's right. like a false comparison that there was this time this fairy tale time where men were men and women were women and everyone kind of knew their roles and things were easy right. and relationships lasted forever. And so maybe that's part of it. Or is it also that the confusion about gender and power and sex and all it's like trickled in everywhere. Is it a both and kind of situation? I think it's, I think it's both. And I think what's, what's happened is that people have a myth of a, of a time gone by that may have been different in a lot of ways, but it wasn't perfect. Um, and it wasn't perfect or better necessarily for either group. Um, and I think that you also have a situation, yes, where power dynamics have shifted. Um, people are in all kinds of different walks of life now where they interact with each other in totally different ways. And I think that's confusing for most people. And I think there's also that mixed with a, a sense that everything should be perfect. It's like, mm -hmm. man, there is supposed to, isn't there supposed to be some perfect life that I'm supposed to be able to attain in some kind of way, okay. um, some perfect relationship or something like that? So the way that I heard you, it seems like in your experience, both men and women, there's kind of like two potential big problems. One is that they don't really understand what the other side wants. That men are saying, I don't really know what a woman wants in order to get her to sleep with me. Women are saying, I don't really know what a man wants to get him to commit to me. And that suggests to me that in most men and women, let's say are good faith actors, like they, they want to be able to give the other person what they want in order to get what they want. Do you think that that's fair? I think most people actually are good faith actors. I, I do. I think, I think most people, not only, I don't think men even just want to sleep with women. I think most men are looking for a woman who would be in a real relationship with them um, and reciprocate whatever love or emotional attention that they are willing to give out. I think that that's how it is for most people, but people generally don't find themselves in a situation where they want to engage with most people. They want to engage in mo generally with a small group of people. And who is and that the small, small group of people? The small group of people are usually just the whatever people are the most physically desirable and um, outgoing uh, and sometimes financially secure also. Uh, that, those are the, that, that small group of people is really like the... Um, it's what everybody compares. When people talk about women who play games or they talk about men who play games and men who don't want to commit, most of the time when people talk about, they're talking about this small group of people who have all of the options in the world and can do pretty much whatever they want and they do whatever they want. Other people are just left on the outside of that in most cases mm -hmm. because they haven't really... Not only is it just even the physical thing, because you can see somebody and be like, oh, well, this person is just as physically attractive as the next, but they have not really mastered dating in the way that someone doesn't master sales or to say so, the way someone doesn't master acting or basketball or football or something like that. Yes, they may look 
physically the same, but they haven't mastered the techniques. And because they haven't, they're in a situation where they're at the mercy of those who have. Men and women are in the same situation. You've kind of mastered how to get certain things out of me that you want without giving very much in return. I haven't been able to do that. Thus, when we deal with each other, I'm always getting the raw end of the deal. So I, when I look at that, I say, well, this is how men treat women. This is how women treat men. When it's really, this is how these group, this group of people is able, are able to treat people. Okay, so that's interesting because on the one hand, we see that maybe a problem that people have, both men and women, is like ignorance. They don't know what the other person wants. They don't know what they have to be in order to, to increase their chance right. of getting that. But a big issue is that both men and women are seeking uh, relationships of all kinds from the most attractive subset of the opposite sex in heterosexual dynamics. And those folks... Um, are, are almost like they're priced out of their their league in the sense of maybe I know what it's going to take in order to get into a relationship. The issue is not here. Ignorance is just too rich for my blood that in order for, let's say, a woman to secure commitment from a guy who's got lots of options, well, uh, I mean, for him to be able to give up not only the the dozen women that he's talking to and all the maybe hundreds of women that he might have in the future, I mean, who who could that woman possibly be? Like the the value of her ex of his exclusivity is so much higher than anything that she could potentially offer, and and maybe that's why people are going to other cultures is because maybe what they're attracted to isn't like the top ten percent here, but maybe they could be attracted to something that's lower than the top ten percent in a different culture, and so they don't have that that problem. Do you think that's that's part of this? Yeah, and I, yeah, I think sometimes it's definitely part of it. And I think people are willing to change. Like, especially, let's let's talk about women for, and then we'll go to men also. For women, a lot of times, if they come over, like, say they come to the Dominican Republic or something like that, a lot of times they'll they'll snatch out the part of this of the scenario that made it the most difficult. So, for instance, they'll say. In America, they might say, I need somebody who makes six figures and looks like this and has this type of personality that's outgoing, bubbly or whatever. Um, and, you know, all of these different things. But they might come to the Dominican Republic and say, I want somebody who has all of those other attributes. But since they don't make as much money, you know, the, the exchange rate is different here. Since the, the money's not here necessarily, I'll take somebody who doesn't make that much money. Well, when you take that out of the equation and you have money or you're doing pretty well financially, well, psh, that now that now all of a sudden the world just opens up and you got so many options that you didn't have in the past. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that obviously there's always going to be different things that go with that, but the options are now there. Well, when you take, go, go ahead. Well, let me talk about this for a second, because I wonder yes. why it would be necessary for women to actually like leave the country in order to, let's say, reduce their criteria. Now, I, right. we can understand that women have, let's say, their highest sexual marketplace value, all other things being equal when they're young. Like according to a Tinder experiment that I talked about on one of my channels, uh, women meet their peak reach their peak sexual marketplace value at 23, according to men. And men reach their peak mar sexual marketplace value at 50, according to women. So there's a huge gap between that. So right. women are most attractive to men at 23, which we could say that's when they can command the best offer. That's when they can be most picky, most demanding, and have the most criteria with the hope that they might actually be satisfied. But a lot of the experience that I have both dating personally and the guys that I speak to is that they're sometimes dealing with women who are, they're, they're 38 now. And it seems like they still have the same criteria that they did when they were 23. Right. And that right. doesn't make a lot of sense. Like if they're willing to reduce, uh, you know, throughout the criteria about making a six figure income, just because they're going to the Dominican Republic, why, why do you think women wouldn't consider doing that earlier? Like from a game theory perspective, it makes sense as a, if I were a woman to like set my standards, like almost impossibly high when I was 18 and then just like 
can continue to reduce them until I could get like the best possible um, secure commitment. Why don't women do that? Why do they seem not to do that? Well, to, I think there's a that, that's a good question. I think there's a couple of different parts, and I'm gonna try my best with it. Um, as far as leaving the country, there's a few different pieces to that. When people leave, a lot of times when women leave, they leave the scrutiny of their friends and family members. Mm. Um, there's also um, I don't want to say I don't want to say it's false, but there's a um, there's a stigma on on not even poverty. There's a, sti a stigma on even median income in America that Americans don't have for people who don't live in America. So if you live in America and you make forty thousand dollars a year, that's not bad. It's not like you're just poor and you don't have anything. You can't support yourself. But in America, people would look at that like, oh, well, you know, I don't want somebody who's making $40,000 a year. But they would go to another country and the stigma would be off. It's like, oh, well, you might be making um, 1,500 pesos a week. And I, well, I'm cool with that, you know, okay. because, because I'm not expecting you to have so much. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go back to what you were talking about as far as the Going, going down in terms of um, they're, what they're looking for. I'm, I'm just going to be totally honest. This might not be a popular opinion to anyone. But when I look at dating strategies, if you took take morals of any kind out of it and take just say what is the what would be the best strategy for a woman in order to produce what she's really trying to produce, let's go back to just straight just animal thought process right to get with to, to get what you're trying to get out of a situation the best thing she could do would be what do they call it um alpha fucks beta bucks uh go have get pregnant by the person with the best genetics that you possibly can because that's the kid you're gonna have and then get somebody else with medium to whatever genetics they might have to help you financially support that child, get as much as you can out of them in terms of resources, then take those resources once your child grows up and go back out into the world and, be, and then be able to enjoy the physical presence of the best looking and most attractive and most pleasing people. I mean, if you just did the math on what would be <laughs> Which would require her to divorce the beta, right? So for, for oh, her to get absolutely. free. Absolutely. That's why you see so many divorces um, initiated by women. I mean, absolutely. If you really think about it, it makes perfect sense. We've talked about this privately. It's like if we are being stone cold, just trying to make the optimal moves within this, the game in terms of like the, the, the benefits and the liabilities, it's like, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of... Um, what I talk about is a lot of human behavior is determined by the systems of reward and punishment in which they operate. And I think that's part of what I hear that men are looking for outside of America is that they don't have to date within the system of incentives that actually motivate that kind of behavior, which is, I would say, is not what most men are looking for, right? Maybe the alpha who just wants to have fun um, I don't know if he necessarily wants to reproduce because that could put him on the hook for certain things. Um, right. But yeah, I think that's why a lot of men are s believing that they could find better options elsewhere because the system of marriage and the incentives around divorce may not be as prevalent or as strong. I mean, I don't know what it's like in the DR, but I, I doubt that they're getting, you know, alimony for the rest of their lives. Is that, is that the fact? I'm not for sure, but I don't think so. No, yeah. I don't think so, actually. It's hard. A lot of these different countries that I've been to, it's a little harder that are not in the Western world. They're not in the Western world. It's a little more difficult for women to be able to secure a lot of the things that um, you can secure in the West, where you can marry somebody, you can get alimony for life, um, you can get half of all, not even just half, you can get all of their property, you can get most of their bank accounts. Um, that's just, 
and it's not as easy to do around here, you know, just mm -hmm. it's not it's just not as easy. They don't even have the same lawsuit culture around here that they do in the so United States. So we we see that and and that can help explain why divorce is so prevalent and why the vast majority of divorces are initiated by women is that they're actually seeing the game kind of clearly and they're just being cold blooded about maximizing their play within that system. But we know that all women don't do that. And so let's go no. back to the idea that maybe part of what allows women to actually get what they want more frequently outside of America is the absence of the, the social pressure to behave in a certain way or to conform. And sure. I, there are two other ways that, um, and I think this particularly impacts women that I've encountered both in my personal life and in my clinical practice. One is um, the doctrine of feminism, which is particularly difficult um, for, I think, young women. I've, when in my 20s, when I was dating women in my 20s, even 20 years ago, uh, I dated some women who were like ideologically opposed to the idea of actually getting in a committed relationship with me, even though it was something that I wanted because they had these ideas about uh, like these kinds of relationships are based on patriarchal ownership and she doesn't want to like settle down because that is an abdication of her sexual liberation. I mean, that happened more than once to me. And I think that that is something that a lot of those women grow out of in their thirties, but it's often, I wouldn't say too late, but they've, they've sort of given a lot of time over to that ideology. So that's one. And the other one that I think really impacts the dating scene is the idea of like the superwoman or the girl boss, that she can do everything, that she has the, um, the high powered job and she can have the husband and kids. And, um, that, that, uh, that letting go of any of those criteria is on some level a admission that she couldn't hack it, that she didn't have the right stuff to be like the super Wonder Woman. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it, it kind of boils down to the fact that in, in, I work with women all the time, so I'm not anti-women in any way, shape, or form. I tell them this to their face. Uh, the reality is Feminism, the world of feminism is the playground for the fuck boy, if you want to call him, you know, without any real judgment. You know, that's what they say. So yeah, tell me the more biggest losers, the biggest losers in feminism are women. They they've actually lost more than anyone. And and here's why I say that. Because in reality, nobody really wants to work. Like nobody really wants to work a job. You know, people want money, sure. People want the trappings of success. People want some level of independence and self-determination. But nobody wants to come and punch a clock and work every day. Nobody wants to do that. So what women have been sold is that you come to work at this job, you're going to be a, a boss, like you said, or, you know, you get an education and you get, take on a lot of student loan debt, um, you're going to, and then at the end of the rainbow, you're going to be a boss. You're going to be up, get a guy and you guys are going to become a power couple where, you know, you go get some other multi-millionaire and y'all build this empire together. And you, you're basically like Oprah and they're like um, Obama or something or whatever you want to, you know. I don't Oprah know. and who? No yeah. one knows who Oprah's partnered with. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so you're Oprah and you're not, but he's not Stedman. You're Oprah and male Oprah, um, you know, you mm -hmm. get what I'm saying? So that's the, that's kind of what women were sold for the most part. And the reality of that is if you're in that 10 to 1% that's able to be able to accomplish a lot of the things, then as far as your life is concerned, it's going to be pretty good. Yeah, you might feel a little upset about the fact that you may not be able to find the guy that you're looking for necessarily, but you still have the opportunity to go somewhere else and hook up in the same way that some of these guys do. But most women are never going to end up doctor, lawyer, Oprah, um, uh, actress, famous, you know, 
of, or some of these influencers even where it's like, oh, I got millions and millions of followers and everybody thinks I'm the most beautiful thing in the world and I got fans. Most women are never going to experience that. It's just not realistic. Most people are going to be secretaries, uh, LPNs. Um, you know, this is, you know, these are decent jobs, not saying they're not, but it's not going to be the glamorous boss life that you were sold. And then what you're going to be left with in most cases is also struggling to even find the equivalent of yourself in a man. So now you're not going to have those two incomes together to be able to create a better life because when you're young, you don't want it. When you get older, a lot of times, I don't want to say you've aged out of it because it's not really true, but it's made it a lot more difficult. Sure. It's not as easy as it was when you were 23, when you were 22. It's just not. So, um, you, unfortunately, you go ahead. Please finish. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's what happens a lot of times. It's like things don't turn out the way you thought it would. Yeah. You're, when people think about feminism, they think about the top. Yeah. I'm going to be a boss. I'm going to be the CEO of Facebook. But for most people, it's like, nah, you're more likely to be like maybe an assistant manager at a grocery store or something like that. That's real. Well, that's that's interesting. A couple of things I want to say about that. Um, my advice to women, especially young women, is that they if they really do want to be everything, if they want to be the successful corporate warrior and they want to have the the husband and the kids, why don't they do the husband and kids part first? Like Absolutely. Like get that locked in in their 20s when they have the best possible chances of attracting the best possible man because they're at their peak sexual marketplace value. And if they feel like they're missing out, they could become an employee in their 30s if they really want to. But most women are trading their 20s, which is when they are at their, their peak um, and able to, let's say, negotiate the best deal for themselves for a, a salary which um, right. you could potentially get at any stage in their life, but it's much, much right. harder to get um, that that kind of commitment at, at, at other stages. But here's the thing. Well, our, okay. Okay. well another thing I wanted to say is um, I hear what you're saying, but I, I don't know if it's really going to change anything. And you know that I used to be an actor. I know you've done some acting too. I'm sure at some point someone said to me, Orion, oh, you know, that 99.9% percent of actors don't make it. It's a really tough profession, but that doesn't stop millions of people from shooting their shot because everyone secretly thinks that they have what it takes to be that top 0.1%. And it's just like a question of when you realize that you're not in that, you know, that very small band, can you get right. out with acceptable loss on some level? But yeah. I think everyone secretly believes that they're going to be the CEO, that they're going to be the movie star, that they're going to be the athlete until right. sometimes it's tragically too late. But well, I think that's th what you were saying there. I think the problem with that for most people, like you, you were saying, most people aren't going to believe that. And I understand that completely. But I think what people often don't do is ask themselves the question, what is it that you actually want from life? A lot of women that I talked to over the years, they they are people who are in the 10, in the 1%. They actually made it. They are the success story. This is the best that story is going to ever get. You know, they made millions of dollars. So I was like, okay, if you can make millions, if you make two or three million, 10 million ain't going to change your life that much. It's just the reality of it. So there are people who I've, who I've worked with over the years who have made millions. And they are in that, they, they're the success story. But for a lot of them, they, they're, they're saying, you know what? The problem with this is these successes that I've been able to accomplish don't get me what I actually want. I wanted the power couple where I was with a guy and he's basically what I am. But unfortunately, the two, three million that I got the, you know, 500,000 I make a year or something like that, whatever I'm making, for whatever reason, my credentials just are not adding up to me being in a situation where I can get the, my equivalent, my male equivalent. I'm in a situation where 
Oprah is with Stedman. You know what I'm saying? Oprah is not with LeBron or Michael Jordan or somebody. You know, <laughs> like, she's not. You know, it's like it, it doesn't. She's not with Tom Cruise or something. You know, it doesn't work that way most of the time. So. Well, yeah, that's another thing I wanted to say, which is, well, let's focus on these top 10% of women who, under feminism, mm -hmm. they are very successful, certainly by, let's say, traditionally male standards or our society standards. They're making a lot of money. They have sure. uh, advanced degrees. They own their sure. houses. Um, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of hypergamy, where women tend to mate and date across and up, generally up. And sure. they at that stage, they generally want guys who have even more than they do. And that's obviously a very small pool. And those men, because of what women tend to be attracted to, have insane optionality. Like Ridiculous. most guys aren't going to look at a woman and be like, damn, look at her bank account, man. Look at her master's degree. Especially, it's like, not, especially not guys who are already rich. Sure, because it's like that whole thing, uh, you know, I already got money, so what do I need your money for? Um, we become sort of irrelevant. And this is something I want to talk to you about, which is how do people, like, price themselves out of relationships? Do you see that happening? Um, yeah, because what often happens with people, okay, first of all, most people who have quote-unquote standards Normally, it's just a list of everything good, right? So they don't really think about what their life would be with any particular person. They just think about a list of all the good things that there are in life. And they say, this is my absolute bare minimum that I'm willing to accept. All the things that put you at the top 0.001% of people, um, not even 1%. It's, now you're just in a some decimal point somewhere. So what most people do, so what people will do is they'll have that in their mind. And then they'll have their own life. And they take almost all of their time. Like, and we're talking about women too. Women, we're talking about women really right now. What they'll do is they'll take their entire lives and they'll work for certain things. Okay, I want to get my degree. I want to get my business going um, or my career or whatever. And I want to get to this certain level. Well, those things take time. So while those things are taking time, a lot of times fertility is dropping. Physical attributes are dropping. I mean, it's very hard to compete with the 20-year-old version of yourself when you're in your mid to late 30s. That's hard. Um, and the same thing happens to men, but there's one caveat, one thing that changes everything. When a man usually gets to that point and he's in his, like it said, what um, the, the men, 50 was their highest uh, sexual Market value. value according to women and their swiping behavior. Yeah. Okay. So you got this guy who's 50 years old. He says, I'm 50 years old. What I want is now at 45, 50 somewhere, I may want to have a family, which I'm still capable of doing if I'm in reasonably good health. I want to have, um, I want to have people around me. I want to have a woman that's going to support me, love me. Uh, that I can talk to, that's going to respect me in a certain way. Finances never came into what he was talking about. And what has he gotten over the years? Influence, finance, wisdom. And most of the time for that man, and if he stayed in reasonable shape, he has some level of physical attraction that he can get with a woman. And he also has things that no 20-year-old, we're being reasonable now, no 20-year-old is able to accomplish. You don't have 50-year-old knowledge at 20. You don't have, you have way more knowledge right now than you did when you were 20 years old. Certainly. So you cannot match 50-year-old knowledge at 20. I know some 20-year-olds think they can, but that's not realistic. You cannot match 50-year-old money from somebody who's been working to build their empire. You can't even match 50-year-old car insurance rates at 20 years old. You can't do it, especially if you're a guy. This is not possible. So because you're not able to do these things, that means that the 50-year-old man is able to compete with the 20-year-old man or a 21 or 25-year-old man on a curve that favors him. Yeah, I, 
I'm young and vibrant and maybe look a little better. I got a yacht. Damn. I can get to the part of the party that they will not let you into. You're not allowed in. I'm over here in a section with my own table and all this stuff, and I'm ordering bottles. You could not even get here because the bouncers are males and they won't let you in because they not because you look good, it's not happening. Okay. So then you take women on the on the flip side of that. They may accomplish all the things that they want to accomplish, but the problem that they run into is they still want the same things. The woman who is Fortune 500, millions of dollars in the bank normally wants the exact same thing as a girl who's on fries at McDonald's. The 20 year old is on fries, you know, trying to make a way. I'm looking for somebody who's financially stable. I'm looking for somebody who um, has wisdom, somebody who's able to teach me and direct me. Well, a lot, a lot of times the CEO is looking for the same thing. I want a mentor. I want somebody who's even smarter than me. What are the chances of that? Let me let's break this down a little bit because I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying, Chaz. But there's something that I've run up against, and uh, I've done some a lot of consultations with the older guys, and they they struggle with this too, which is that mm -hmm. all things being equal, women want men who are higher status, who are wealthier, who have their lifestyle taken care of, uh, that have some wisdom, that have that kind of experience that they can take charge and direct. Um, but what I've discovered is that it's not like women are lining up for those men and making it easy. That on some level, a lot of guys that talk to me are like, I don't get it, Orion. I have the yacht. And when I go out with women, they say, I don't care about a yacht. It's not like they're they're just like, maybe if you're in the top 0.0001% of men and you're world famous, the women are going to be like, waiting outside of your tour bus or outside of your hotel room to just sort of like strike up a conversation with you. But there's plenty of really high value successful men who it's not like the women, they still have to kind of like approach women and start from zero and to kind of like make them think they're not serial killers and that, yeah, they do have something to offer. And, right. and oftentimes, I don't know if they're, they're lying or they're not aware of their, selection biases but a lot of women are like i don't i don't want those things i don't want a yacht like and and why do you think that just because you have a yacht and a lot of money that you uh like deserve or earn access to me does, does that make sense yeah absolutely i want to start here though everybody in the united states of america wants a yacht <laughs> they're they're lying there they might be lying to themselves nobody wants to be poor especially not in america because America is a totally different country if you're poor. Like it's totally different. <laughs> you know. Well, I've heard that the a best rich person is America and a poor person is America. Totally different. I've heard that the best day in a boat owner's life is the day he buys the boat, and the second best uh, day is the day he sells it. So absolutely, I, can, I definitely can buy that. I've heard that too. Okay, so let's go into what you were talking about here. All right, now here's what I because I work with a lot of guys who are in the same situation you were talking about. They got all kinds of money. They're doing really well, but Here's what normally happens. They say money changes you. You know, people say, ah, money changes people. Money, money changes you. Well, in a lot of cases, when people get money, doesn't change them enough. <laughs> doesn't change you fundamentally. Doesn't change you internally. Like they still have poverty think, or scarcity mentalities. Is that what you mean? Scarcity mentality. But they also have, they also care. You know what, you know what makes a guy be able to get women no matter what his situation is, not caring, yeah. complete indifference towards, because if you're a person and you look at, you really have an abundance mindset, you're not thinking, oh man, I got a yacht and I got a, a nice car and I got a nice house and I got all of these things. So these women should line up to come date me. You're not really thinking about that because it's like, well, I, yeah, but there's other people who might have those things too. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. I am the person who was able to get this stuff. Me, I have been able, I didn't win the lottery and get it because there's not very many lottery winners in the world. So I didn't win the lottery and get it. I was actually able to accomplish things that put me in a position to be where I am today. 
And that is what I bring. When you talk to me, that should come out. It should ooze out of my pores that I feel like I'm that guy. And some people feel like they're that guy when they're in middle school. And from being in middle school and feeling like they're that guy, they don't have any bitterness. They don't have any frustration. Remember I talked about earlier, you have years of going through these things, so you read signs. It's like the guy is talking about, oh, she doesn't care about the yacht and all that kind of stuff. How the hell do you know that? How do you know that? Well, what I'm saying is that sometimes they're out on dates and they report that is that they're they're trying yeah, that's to impress like, the women, and they're saying, "Hey, they're I, saying, say I got that," and, and the women are like, "I don't." How care. do you know? How do you know that they didn't want the yacht? What I'm saying is like when you start going, "I got a yacht, I got this, I got that," and all these kind of things, and you might try to tell women when you meet them, what you're you don't know if they don't care about the yacht or not. You the way you presented the yacht to them is normally the issue. Because you go out here, you go, oh, okay, well, let me show you. Not you. I'm just talking about people you talk to. Um, the They're going out here saying, I got the yacht. I got the plane. Hey, girl, I just made this business deal and all this kind of stuff. And the woman might be like, you know what? I would be extremely impressed with that if I found out about that on my own. But because you told me about the yacht and you told me about all of this, you have not triggered my chase instinct. Mm. You are the same dude that makes a big valentine for a girl in the fifth or sixth grade and presents it to her and goes, hey, pretty girl, look what I made you. Do you want it? Take this and with my heart, take that also. You, you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. A lot of these guys will get money and all of that kind of stuff, but you have not changed internally to the point where when you meet somebody, the 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 idea that you could be gone in a in a blink of an eye or you make your feelings are unclear because women are, as we know, studies have shown that women are attracted to guys whose feelings are unclear. I can tell you that that's true because I work with women day after day and I know who they ask me about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you come into the situation, oh, I got a yacht. Well, you're telling her you're really interested and you're telling her a yacht is all you have to offer, which is a lot, but you're telling her that you're trying to offer a yacht in order for her to date you. Rather than being like, yo, I'm the type of person who gives yachts. So when I talk to you, I'm talking about me as a person. I'm asking you about you. And if you don't seem vibing with me and you don't seem interested, that doesn't bother me. You know, because yeah. if you don't change internally, you're not going to get any different results, no matter how much money you get. The way I, I think that's really well said, Chaz, um, and I talk about these things like yachts and uh, sports cars as a, a traction proxies, because I think a lot of guys believe that if they get those things, then that will solve their attraction problems. Right. Usually the only way to solve the attraction problem is by behaving more attractively with women. And I think this is a consequence of a failure of most men to understand how female attraction works, which is, um, I, I think guys have this, and it serves them well in a lot of contexts, they have this like really explicit problem solving mentality. And it's almost like, okay, I have a problem. I want to get sex. Okay, what do I have to do to get sex? Okay, I have to go out. I have to ask them out. Uh, I'll buy them a drink. I'll take them to a restaurant. I'll act interested. And then if I do all those three things, then I have a, like a 78.2% chance that it will end in a sexual encounter at the end of the night. Right. Kind of yeah, absolutely. And, and so yeah. they have that with the dating and, and they never really grow out of that. And they just kind of make the same mistake at a at a larger and bigger magnitude because now instead of just you know spending a few hours on a date buying drinks, they're spending a decade of their life building wealth, but they're really doing it to get laid or to get a relationship, just like they did when they were broke. And so, do you think it's fair to say that all things being equal, a man will have? Um, what do you think? It, which man will have? greater optionality with women with respect to sex and relationships the guy who doesn't who's who's kind of broke or is just sort of like non-remarkable with respect to his status and wealth but has let's say game and understands how to how to finesse and talk to women or a guy who's got all those things and still has that kind of mentality that we described um yeah game game pretty much beats everything okay here's why yeah. Okay, you take a you take a broke guy, right? I used to work in the jail as a guard. 
And um, I saw a phenomenon that was one of the most amazing things. I saw guys who were locked up in jail of all races with a lot of times really good looking women who had good careers. And I was like, this is, at first I started hating. Oh, you mean like on the outside? Else. So the, the, they were still like waiting the, for this? The woman the would be on it, yeah. Coming down, giving the guy money, visiting the guy. I mean, some of these guys got so much money that's coming into them from sometimes three or four different women. Um, you know, and these women pay them. These guys will cuss the girl out on the phone or whatever, you know, and she'll still just come down there and give them money and put money on his books, visit. I mean, it's what they do, you know. And, and some of these women, they're not all the people that you would go, oh, well, she must be some stupid, unattractive. No, they're not all like that. A lot of some of them are, a lot of them are, but some of them are actually really attractive and they have good careers. And what I've learned by just watching people and interacting and asking questions is, like you said, a lot of times when you're successful is because you've used an analytical mind. But we, sometimes you can be more successful with women and with relationships and humans when you realize sometimes two plus two equals five. What do you mean by that? It doesn't always make sense. <laughs> it doesn't always have to make sense. Some when you're when you're dealing with a woman, right, and you're a person who's like, I'm really analytical in the way that I think. I'm really logical in terms of my brain. How do you sell something to somebody using logic? Oh, you don't. That's why no one does. They sell an idea. They sell an emotion. Um, exactly. No advertising, they, like try our carbonated high fructose corn syrup because no, they're selling that it's Christmas. You wouldn't buy it. Yeah. You wouldn't buy it. Who would buy fast food if they used a logical selling point? Mm -hmm. No, they, they show you the steam coming off the burger and everybody's having a good time. High five. Psh, 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 no fat people in sight. And you're like, oh, man, if I have this burger on a subconscious level, you're like, if I have this burger, I'm going to have a good time. Mm -hmm. that's what a person who has game understands how to sell the experience. Not that I have the yacht. I could be on your yacht and the girl that's on your yacht. I'm going to make her feel like this experience is being provided by me. And it's a part of our situation and our dating, uh, even though you're the person who bought the yacht. And people who have game are good enough at doing that. Whereas people who don't develop game, it's like, I'm going to develop money and that's going to take the place of game. Mm -hmm. No, because even when you get a girl, what is she going to try to do? Separate you from your money. So uh, how do people learn game? Because I, I don't believe that the vast majority of men are naturally confident or that they inherently understand female psychology in this way. And uh, a lot of the advice that you hear, certainly in popular media and in our culture is almost like, it's so wrong. It, it just, it leads, it right. makes things worse. So um, how do people learn game? How do men well, learn? Nece necessity is the mother of invention, you know, was it Benjamin Franklin that said that? Help me out. I think it um, might have been necessity's mother invention. So um, for most people, what ends up happening, the way most people will develop game is the way, same way most people develop sales skills, the same way most people develop the hustler mentality. They have to. Now, some people try to skip the step by getting money. Like, oh, they'll say, I'm not going to date until I get money. So then they don't have any game. The way you develop game is when you're on the way up, especially, and even if you're already there, take away some of what you have. Don't use it. Talk to people. Start learning how to actually have conversations with people and develop a relationship out of thin air, out of nothing. How do I go up to this person without all my fanciest clothes on? How do I go up to this person without a $300,000 watch on my wrist? How do I go up to people, even people I'm not interested in on a physical level, how do I go up to people and just start developing relationships with them? They could be platonic relationships. They could just be acquaintances. How do I go up to people and talk to them and have conversations and start understanding what people actually want? What do people really want? And what are they willing to do to get it? 
when you, that's what if you talk to a hustler, you talk to somebody that's like a con person, a con man, con woman, what they are good at is finding out what you want, exactly what your truest desires are. And when they figure out what you want, all they do is fill in for that, what you really want. Like most people will say, oh, well, a woman wants to be on a yacht. Why? See, you bought a yacht because you saw girls on a yacht. Why do they want to be on a yacht? You got to figure that part out and provide that with you and not just the yacht. Hmm. What make is that they're looking for the experience. They're looking for what they believe a yacht means. The status that a yacht provides, the enjoyment, the, the, the stuff they saw on the video where everybody was popping champagne and they just seemed like they were having such a good time. That's what they want from that yacht. Most of them don't really know what kind of yacht you got. They don't know, you know, they don't have much yacht information. So would it be fair to say that, well, because I often say this to my clients is that if it works in sales, it works in dating. And For sure. uh, what is in common in both of those things is that what really seems to be successful is the ability to cultivate an emotional experience. Absolutely. That is, can we say that that's kind of game in a nutshell is the ability to cultivate an emotional experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. And to make that experience something that they feel like they can't get anywhere else. Um, for people who grew up in the 80s and 90s, that was the crack era, right? In, in the 80s and 90s, they had this, like, they had these people that, y'all probably, some of y'all younger people may not even know about crackheads, but they would just be just really on, you know, just really after it, getting after it. <laughs> and what most of them, most of them, it's not even necessarily the chemical dependency as much as what their body and their mind is telling them is that first high that you got, you're gonna, your body tries to chase that, your mind tries to chase that, you chase it on a spiritual level for the rest of your life. They call that chasing the dragon. Mm -hmm. Now, because of that, that, that experience that you want to get back over and over again, even if you keep getting a diminished version of it, you keep chasing it over and over again. What a lot of men don't understand when you go out with women, when you deal with women, if you can create that experience and that feeling and tag and tap into something emotionally one time, have you ever noticed that women would date a guy who has doesn't seem like he has anything to offer? That you're like, why do you keep going back to this dude? Well, they're chasing the dragon. That dude is. Murphy would say that, they, that he fucked her really good, and that's part of why she she keeps coming back, and that's certainly part of the. Uh, they one, may be a little bit small, small, small amount. Yeah, but a person. It's just like with a girl. Okay, look, the worst piece of pussy you ever have in your life is still good. Mm -hmm. But how many guys do you know are chasing after a woman who hasn't slept with them in three, four, five, six years, sometimes even more? Still chasing, still hoping, man, one day if I do this, she'll come back. One day if I do that, she'll come back. You might even look at the girl and be like, she's not even really that attractive. It probably wasn't even that good or that much better than the last woman. Mm -hmm. But she was somehow able to tap into an experience, an emotional connection that you had, and it, and it hit all the factors, your mind, your body, your spirit. And because that happened, you're going to chase that for as long as you possibly can. You're going to, you'll, you'll chase it until you have nothing left. And what a lot of guys don't really understand and what guys who have game do understand, I need to create an experience. And as many times as I can create that experience, it renews this woman's attraction for me. I don't need to, to, to create it with money. I don't need to create it by doing spectacular things that matter so much. It's just, I need to find out what makes that woman tick and I need to create that experience. Some guys create it in a negative way. Sometimes, how, do they, uh, go ahead. Well, how do they figure that out? I imagine uh, you can't just ask directly because a lot of people actually don't know what, what they really want. Do you think that that's true? Absolutely, it's true. When you talk, okay, the way um, it's like, um, I, I actually sold cars and a couple of different items. My father, I always say this, my father was the greatest salesman ever lived. Um, and he got the plaques and everything to prove it. He taught me a lot of stuff about sales. And one of the biggest things is to sell somebody something, you got to really listen. Not just listen to what they tell you, but also listen to what they don't tell you. 
So when you look at somebody, you say you get it, say you get a life, a nice girl that you you find attractive, and you're just like, what makes this girl tick? I don't understand this woman. What is it that I need to know about her that that these are the things that make that matter the most to her? Well, when you want to figure that out about somebody, don't ask them what the most important things are. Ask them about other things. Hey, you know, what's your favorite movie? Figure out what movie they like to go see. Do they like to go see romantic comedies? Well, that means that they want, a lot of times, they want that up and down uh, boy meets girl, boy loses girl love story. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times, like if you watch a guy who likes Spider-Man, he wants that story about the nerd who meets a girl that's the love of his life. He finally gets superpowers. You get what I'm saying? You can tell a lot about a guy by by that. You can tell that's a lot about women by them. So that basically kind of goes on the psychological premise of identification, that that's kind of how movies work and stories work, mm -hmm. is that we Absolutely. identify yeah. with certain characters, and that's easier to do than others. And maybe we identify um, almost wishfully, like with the people that we most want to be or, or would like most to be. And if we're good at kind of analyzing those themes or that work, we can kind of re reverse engineer a person's self-concept or or what their yeah. desire might be. That's interesting. Because cause what we normally what we normally identify with the most is somebody who is the closest to us transformed into the best version of us. Hmm. So when we watch a movie or a show or something like that, it's normally going to be the thing, like if you like, like look at Rocky. Rocky's not perfect. Rocky's kind of slow witted, um, doesn't talk very intelligently. He's poor. He's not, doesn't have a great record as a fighter. He's somebody who you say, wow, this guy's, you know, he's kind of a loser. He gets this opportunity, this chance out of nowhere where Apollo Creed says, hey, I'll fight you. And the transformation that Rocky takes, he has a he has a mentor. And you gotta look at you gotta pay attention to every piece of the story. He has a mentor that comes in and trains and changes him into the person that could actually fight Apollo Creed and be successful enough to go down to the last second. Rocky loses in the end, but Rocky becomes somebody you can admire. And Which these is are interesting the steps because that he took. That wasn't very popular. I mean, it, clearly there was a dozen sequels, but I think he wins in every other movie. It's almost like people couldn't let the story end with Rocky losing. That's that's another thing that people don't think about when they think about relationships. Why do a lot of women go back to a guy who doesn't call them? Why do they call over and over again? It's the cliffhanger. The story didn't win the way that I want to. People chase the happy ending. Just like they did with Rocky. They knew when they made Rocky lose that fight that you would be so happy to go see Rocky too. They knew it. Rocky loses. Look at Rocky 3. He I loses love. the Clever Lang the first time. Rocky is a fantastic movie in, in other respects too. Uh, Stallone, I think, wrote it in three days. He just like got this inspiration. He sat down and in a frenzy, he wrote the entire script by himself in a long weekend. And uh, it was rejected by, I think, hundreds of uh, producers right. because he insisted that he play the part. Like a lot of people, right. a few people expressed interest in the script and he said, no, it has to be me. And so it's interesting because that was his his directorial and his star debut too. So it the real life story of Rocky kind of parallels the uh, the, the narrative structure of Rocky, which I think is fascinating. Right. It's about a guy named Chuck Webner who was, uh, well, you probably, you, you know, like uh, Sylvester Stallone was in the um, was in the audience when he was fighting Muhammad Ali. So that's why uh, Apollo Creed's character is so much like Muhammad Ali. I didn't know um, that. And, and, and Webner was a was a a mob collections guy. Um, he basically was, he's basically Rocky. He's basically Rocky Balboa. So that's kind of that's really interesting. I've never thought of it that way as a means to kind of like indirectly uh, analyze what a person might really want. That's that's really interesting. I want to I want to pivot one more um, to one more direction, which is okay. Most guys don't have game. Most guys don't even understand the importance of game. Um, but 
let's talk about something that can happen once you become successful uh, with game. It's almost like I think the cynicism that comes with being a successful salesman, like you could sure. be an ad exec at Coke and make, you know, billions of dollars for that company and feel rightly accomplished in your ability to do so. But at the same time, mm -hmm. I got to believe in your heart of hearts, you're like, I'm manipulating people into buying carbonated sugar water. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like the thing, once you realize as a man, what women actually respond to and what dramatically increases your chances of sex and relationships, I think it can make a person cynical. Um, sure. Because a lot of the things that men would like to be, I think most men would like to be honest and forthright and direct and uh, let's say transparent and to show they say, hey, I really like you and, and, to, and to be that version of themselves. That doesn't usually work in the vast majority of contexts. And I think guys have to struggle with this idea. Like I kind of have to be this version of myself that I don't like as much, or I have to be the version of myself I like more and, and suffer the, um, the lower outcome rate associated with women. I don't think that, I don't think you even have to make a choice between the two. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things is there's multiple ways that you can do the same thing. Like if you're a salesman, there's a couple different types of salesmen. Some people sell you by making you feel like, you know, something's way better than it really is. And some people sell you by selling you on their honesty and selling you on themselves. You got to understand that there are going to be people who respond to that just as much as they respond to whatever gamesmanship or whatever type of um, false narrative you might try to sell. Most of the time, if you're if you are somebody who's accomplished enough that you that that you've been able to do some of the things you want to do with your life. And it doesn't even have to be major. Um, but if you if you feel good enough about yourself, you feel good about, enough about the product that you're selling, you don't really have to lie to anybody. Absolutely. You just tap in, you just tap into the parts. You just let that person know what they want to buy. See, this is the thing. Like if you're selling, if I was selling you a car and I sold cars for a long time, if I'm selling you a car, there's people who are trying to make you want to buy a car you don't want to buy. Those people will never get your family members to buy from them. They'll never get you to bring person after person to them to where they don't really have to do much work. But you take somebody who says, "I, you tell me what you want. If we got it here, I'm going to show you why this is, this is it. You may have all the things. Like I said before, people usually don't know what they want. They just have a stack of the things that are good. But what I'm going to break down from you is I'm going to say, what exactly is it that you really want? Not just from what you tell me, but what I've observed from you, what you really want. You want somebody that's going to be a mentor to you. I can tell that by some of the lack of direction that you might have. So if I know that I'm that type of person anyway, all I'm going to do is through my actions and words, I'm going to show you how I'm that and create that experience of mentorship. Now you come back to me for that over and over again. If you're a person that wants um, to have an exciting time or you want somebody that's going to protect you, if I know that I'm that person anyway, all I'm doing is showing you that this is what you're supposed to be buying. The, the customer needs direction. I tell women this all the time. The, the guy probably wants most of the things that you have to offer we know he wants at least one of those things. Let's be real. So why are you struggling to sell him that? The mm -hmm. reason why is because he doesn't, you're not saying here, this is where it is. This is what you, these are the things that I know you want. And it's right here. <clears throat> when you deal with women, if you, if you figure out what they actually want, most of the time you have a lot of the things that they actually want. Maybe not the stuff that's on that list. It doesn't matter. Like, oh, well, I'm not six foot five, Chaz, and I don't make $600 million a year, and I don't have five jets. Well, what do did, what did they actually want? Why do they want to be on the yacht? Why do they want to be on the jet? Why? If you start figuring out why and not just the thing, the metal and, and the leather and all that, if you figure out what it actually is that they want, nobody really wants a burger from a fast food restaurant, somebody has a need 
they don't want the cholesterol and all the other stuff that goes along with it. They have a need, and that restaurant showed them, here's how you're, I'm going to fill this particular need. So they don't necessarily need to be on a yacht. They need all the things that they feel go with that. You may not have a yacht, but you can say, look, I know you want to have a good time. I know you want to feel connected with your friends and you want your friends to be jealous of you because you're doing something that they can't do. Here's how I can provide that experience, even though I may not have a yacht, even though I may not have any money to spend on you. But the shortcut for a lot of guys is money. Here, I don't really know how to create any experience. So I'm going to go to my bank account, get a whole bunch of money out and throw it on top of you and then hope that you're going to that you're going to like me. Mm. OK, well, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, we're, we're nearing the end. How about we talk as a closing idea uh, based on what we've been discussing of late, like with game and success in women, what do you think might be one of the easiest things that men can begin to implement like today to move the needle in the direction of getting what they want from women? The easiest thing that you can implement today without doing any other work is just go up and actually talk to people, not with an agenda, not like, oh, I want to smash tonight. Just go up and start talking to strangers. Talk men, to people that, that, that you don't even like have just, interest in. Men and women, anybody you see on the street, talk to strangers. Once you start getting more used to talking to people and listen and actually start listening to what they want, their hopes, their dreams, that's going to make it easier for you to deal with any woman. Mm -hmm. So not only because it would help you, I imagine, to overcome the approach anxiety of just striking up a conversation Absolutely. with a, a but not, stranger. Yeah, right. But also gives you, it also gives you the, the cues to listen for. When you're doing it, you can listen so much more intently with somebody that you're not physically interested in. You know, when somebody's talking to you, you start, you're just listening like, oh, you know, dang, I didn't, wow, it's crazy. And you're not trying to impress you're not trying to get their conversation, your conversation, your talking points out. You're just listening most of the time. And you start realizing, you know what? The woman that I was talking to a couple of weeks ago told me a whole lot of stuff that I wasn't listening to because I was trying to say I got a yacht. I was trying to say I got a plane. I was trying to say I got money. But if I'd have been listening, I would have been like, you know what? Damn, she, she told me some of the cues and some of the things I could have used. And I could have called back to and made her see like, you know, it's just like when, you, when you're telling jokes or something like that, you're you're reading the audience and you're bringing stuff back around. That's what makes a comedian funny. Mm. If you're not, if you're not listening and you're not paying, and you're just trying to get your, your jokes off or you're just trying to get whatever you want to tell them. Like, oh, I got, I'm a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I got money. You know, you don't even know what you should be saying. It's like when you sell a car to somebody and they're like, yeah, you know, I got five kids. And then you you say, yeah, man, this Porsche that I got right here, bro, you know, it gets uh, from zero to 60, however long. You know, like, bro, I didn't, okay, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Like, you got to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's been uh, fascinating. Chaz, it's been so great to talk with you today. This has been a really enlightening conversation for me. Uh, if people want to know more about you and what you're doing, how should they check you out? Um, you can go to any of my YouTube channels, Ask Chaz Ellis or the Chaz Ellis Guy channel. Um, also, you can go to chazellis.com if you want like any special help or consultation. I do those too. Cool. I'll put those links in the description below. Thanks again for talking with us today, Chaz. It's been great. No problem. It was great. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye-bye.